It was the time of the Passover, which meant that there wasn't going to be any question at all about where they were going to find Jesus. They knew where he was going to be. It's kind of like if, there is, uh, if there's an Atlantic Braves baseball game on in the evening, I know where to find Pastor H, Pastor Artsaw. That's where he's going to be. And if there's an episode of, say, Dancing with the Stars, then I know where Ken Adams and Matt Slight and, and John Lumpkin are going to be. <laughs> Just kidding. If it's time to clean, you know, if it's chore time, time to clean the house, you know where you're going to find your kids? Nowhere. <laughs> At the time of Passover, there was no question about where the folks were going to be able to find Jesus. It was the same place that he was the Passover before that and the Passover before that. Jesus' mom and dad, earthly mom and dad, did a great job of instilling in him some patterns of life. And those included going to the temple to celebrate the different feast days that God had set up for his people to keep them from forgetting the great things that God had done. We also know not only was that a regular pattern like in the annual calendar of uh, Jesus' family, but we read in Luke Luke's gospel that Jesus went to the synagogue, whatever community he was in, and it says, as was his custom. So if you come across people that say, you know, being in church isn't all that necessarily important, the next question you need to ask them is, do you want to be like Jesus? They're probably going to say yes. And if they say yes, you you need to remind them, he went to to worship every week. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. When it came time for the Passover, he joined in with pilgrims, pilgrims that had come from near and far to commemorate and to celebrate the most pivotal event in the life of the history of God's people up to that point. That was the deliverance of the Israelite people out of bondage after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. We know that, um, that you, know, you know the story. The people are in bondage. God comes to Moses, says, I'm going to use you to get them out. He goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is uh, not, he's not into letting the people of God and all of his slave labor force just waltz out of there um, like nothing, without a fight. So God has to continue to do these things to get Pharaoh's attention. Does God ever have to do a lot of things to get your attention? Well, you know what one of my prayers is sometimes? I pray, God, I want to get to the point where you don't need a ball bat to get my attention. But all it takes is a whisper. And I'm responding. Pharaoh wasn't like that. One plague, two plagues. Got all the way up to ten plagues and God, you know, he brought out the big guns. Got this, this, the idea that we'll bring a death angel over all of Egypt. And he prepared his people for that. He said, here's what you need to do. Get together with your family. If you have a small family, add another neighbor family with you. But he outlined exactly what they were to do in sacrificing a lamb and taking the blood and putting it over the door frame of their house so that when the death angel passed over Egypt, when he saw the door frames that were covered with the blood, salvation came to that house. Every other household didn't have the blood of the lamb. You know what happened? Death came to the firstborn. And finally, Pharaoh says, enough. He signs the Emancipation Proclamation that gets the Israelite people out of there, and, uh, and they're they are off. And God said, this was such a big deal of what I did for your all's deliverance, I don't want you to forget it. You ever notice how when we forget what God's done for us, when we get spiritual amnesia, we not only lose our appreciation, but we lose our way. And God said, I don't want my people to lose their appreciation of what I've done for them, and I don't want them to lose their way. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to work into the annual fabric of their life a reminder every year that they are delivered because I delivered them. So it's that time of year. Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He's with all different kinds of people, and the place is packed out. I mean, there's so many people all over town that you can't stir them with a stick. It's that way in the temple. It's that way in the restaurants. I kind of imagine Jerusalem at that day being exactly like Wilma Rudolph on a payday Friday night. (laughs) You can't get anywhere. And if you want to go eat, you better be prepared to stand in line. That's the way it was in Jerusalem. They had come from near and far to celebrate the feast 
of the Passover. And one of the places that the crowd was very evident was the place of worship that was supposed to be the center of attention during this feast. Um, It was the temple. And it too was packed out. Their attitude was the more the merrier. Let's make room for more. Let's just squeeze in a little bit tighter. The bigger the crowd, the better. There wasn't any place le- there weren't any places left in the parking lot and there was a traffic jam on Trenton Road, whatever their Trenton Road was. There were people everywhere. And the problem wasn't the size of the crowd, but there was a problem. The problem was the very thing that was supposed to be central the whole reason they were there got pushed to the side. And instead of focusing this way, they started focusing on lots of other stuff. Here's what it looked like. The temple was set up very intentionally by God. He gave the instructions, the directions for how to do it. It had basically three different areas. One of them was called the Holy of Holies. That was a place that housed the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments. And and it was a very special area of the temple where only one person could go and only one time a year. The high priest on the Day of Atonement. The other area, the next area was called the Holy Place. And if you were a Jew um, who followed God, you, you could worship there. The third area was called the Outer Court. And that would be, if we were living in that day, that'd be where we were at. Because it was for the Gentiles. But even in the very structure of the temple, God was making room, not just for the Jewish people, but for all who would believe in him. And he wanted his house to be hospitable to anybody who was pursuing him, looking for him. So he created this place called the outer court. That's where the Gentiles were allowed to worship. Okay, hold that thought. At the time of all this, that all this was going on, the, um, the pilgrims that would come from a long distance away wouldn't necessarily bring their sacrificial animals to offer as sacrifices and an act of worship. They didn't necessarily bring them with them, especially if they had a very long way to go. So there was a system that got set up. And there was a, uh, let's say, uh, off over here, away from the temple somewhere, there, there were pastures that were specifically set aside where the animals that were used in sacrifices at the temple were, were found. So, you, you know, if we came from a long way off and we didn't bring our animal with us, we'd go there, we'd buy one, we'd bring it here to the temple, and we would sacrifice it. Now, I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's just assume for a second that initially what happened was the folks who operated things at the temple said, you know, these guys have already traveled a long way. We shouldn't make them have to go any further to go find the animal for their sacrifice. Let's make it convenient for them. Maybe, just maybe, that's how it started. But for whatever reason, they took the animals that were some distance away and they brought them up close. Only they brought them up so close they ended up putting pins right in the outer court. Which was the only place the Gentiles could could go to gather and assemble to worship God. So there were cattle and sheep and there were doves and there were goats. And in that place that was supposed to be a place of worship, it looked like a zoo. And it smelled like one too. And there's money changers that are set up and vendors and and the, the folks that are serious about, you know, having an encounter with God, they can't even hear the sound of their own prayers over the sound of the, of the, of the sheep and the cows and the money vendors and changers and the vendors come buy your stuff here. It was a circus. It would be like us trying to have a worship service in the middle of a Mardi Gras parade. Not exactly an atmosphere conducive to connecting with God. It is this scene that Jesus steps into when he comes to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. You know that there are some things in our life that require attention right now. I mean that it's just ludicrous to even wait any time at all. Let's say that it's summertime, just a couple months away. And so you start really warming up to your friends that have pools. I start really warming up to my friends that have pools. Right, Ken? (laughs) So you go over to your friends and they, they have a little gathering and some other folks are there and you're sitting maybe under an umbrella and you're drinking some lemonade and one of the the families that's there has a little toddler who toddles their way all the way over to the edge of the deep end of the pool. And the next thing you know, they're in it. So everybody sitting over in the umbrella who watches it happen says, as soon as I finish my drink. No. 
That requires action, and it's not action tomorrow or next week or the next day. It's right now. There's a sense of urgency that's created about that. The same thing happens if you're in a restaurant and you're a doctor or you're a paramedic or you're, you're somebody that just, you know, you watch it on TV, how to do the whole Heimlich thing, and somebody at the table next to you is choking on a chicken bone. You don't say, as soon as I finish my dessert and my coffee, I think I'll help them out. Somebody's got to spring into action right now. Certain situations call for immediate response. You know another one of those? When people live in a city where 87% of the people that are there don't go to church, it's time for somebody to start taking some action. And we don't say, when we get this program together, when we get that together, when we, when we finish doing this, the time to act on lost people who don't know Jesus as their Savior is not next week, it's not next month, and it's certainly not next year. The time for somebody to do something about that is today. And that's one of the reasons why we gave you these bracelets. If you haven't got one yet, I encourage you to get one. They should be out by the Welcome Center. It's got 1% and the Grace logo on that. Why is that? Somebody tell me who remembers a sermon from about a month ago. To get 1% of the lost people in Clarksville who are out of church today into church tomorrow. That's what he's called us to do. That's over 1,000 people. Each of you do two people, we're good to go. That's a good start. But we, whenever there's a sense of urgency, it creates the desire to not do something later on, but to do it right now. When Jesus walked into the temple and he saw that mess and the mockery that had been made of God's house, he didn't say, you know, I think I'll come back in a couple of weeks and do something about that. He looked around, and I can just imagine his eyes darting around that scene. He finds some cords. He goes over and finds a chair, and he starts braiding together a whip. I love this scene. I don't, I don't love it because of all the bad stuff that's going on uh, as the temple's been desecrated. What I do love is it shows us a very different picture of, the, of Jesus than the meek, mild, let the world run over me, I'm not in control kind of God. I'm telling you, he's in control. And they, they're going to question his authority to do this, but he, he gets this, uh, this whip put together, and the next thing you know, I can just picture the adrenaline running through his body like a fire hydrant that's open, wide open. His biceps are bulging, the veins in his neck are sticking out, and he starts turning over tables and whipping that whip and getting the money changers out of there saying, you're not doing this in my house. And immediately, he starts cleaning up what's there because he is literally consumed with passion. And zeal for the house of the Father. He's got a vested interest. It's his dad's house. And he's got a good idea about what needs to be happening there. And what he's seeing now doesn't fit. This story is in John chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them with me. And uh, find your place there, John chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. And after you've found it, if you'll go ahead and stand... In honor of the reading of the word, that'd be great. If you don't have your Bible with you today, uh, bring it next week. When you come back and bring two people with you. And, and, and for the time being, you can watch it on the screen. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? But the temple that he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. You may be seated. A couple of different ways in just this short section of scripture that we see the image of the temple being used. 
On one hand, it really is the brick and mortar structure that people came to offer sacrifices and give their worship to God. But in a sentence, Jesus twisted and, and uh, he, he redefines it and he reframes it in saying that his very body is also a temple that they will destroy and in three days later it will be raised and thank God that's exactly what happened. But throughout the scriptures, we find these different images um, of how this, this word temple is used. And, it's all, and, and it all relates. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 um, had to correct some, some kind of squirrely behaviors that were going on in the church there. Sometimes that happens. What took place was the, the attitude and the mindset of the culture outside the church had made its way inside the church. And so they were Christian people who were following Jesus, but they were accepting and adopting the practices of the world out there when it came to their sexuality. So Paul addresses that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this is what he says. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins people commit are outside their bodies, but those who sin sexually sin against their own bodies. Do you not know that your bodies... Your bodies, this isn't just Jesus' body, temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body, my body, a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You, brothers and sisters, Clarksville Grace, Church of the Nazarene, Tennessee, today, you don't belong to you. You are not your own, but you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, Paul, Paul is talking here specifically about sexual sin. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today, but I, 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 want to, I want us to stop here and visit for a minute. You all know that we live in a society that is absolutely sex-saturated. And we're getting all kind of ideas about how to have sex and who to have it with and where it's okay and how often and all this business that is totally contrary to what God says in His Word. Amen. And, uh, and by the way, for the rest of the world that may not know this, who designed sex to start with? God. It was His idea. And He said it will happen. It needs to happen in the context of some boundaries that make it good. Those boundaries are one man and one woman who call themselves husband and wife, who stay that way their whole life. Sex in that context, good. Very good. Sex outside that context, bad. Very bad. We have a group of young people sitting over here who are the most vulnerable to what I'm talking about. Not that we're immune from it, but they're the most vulnerable. Every single day of their existence, the schools that they walk into the songs that they hear on the radio, the commercials that they see on television are constantly bombarding them with images and ideas about human sexuality that are not what God wants it to be. We need to pray for them. And not only do we need to pray for them, we need to put on display for them a model of Christian sexuality that is worth emulating. Examples that are worth following. Because the rest of the world, you know what the rest of the world says to our young people? You aren't any better than an animal. You're going to come in heat, it's going to happen, protect yourself. And God says, you're not an animal. You are a human being created in my image. And whenever sin of any sort is involved, it doesn't make you more human, it makes you less human. Substandard of what God had in mind when he made you. And regardless of what the world says, regardless of how many people say it, what profile, high profile positions they may be in, the plan for sex has not changed. And it won't. No matter what scientists say, it won't change. One man, one woman, married for life, that's the only place it's good. And Paul had to remind them, you you get engaged in sex in any other way, you are doing damage to your own body, which by the way happens to be the temple where God says, I want to live. There are other ways we can defile the temple that is our body. We, um, we sometimes find it easier to talk about all the physical sins that we don't do than the ones that we do do. 
So, you know, I'll talk about people that, or it's easier for me to talk about the sins like, you know, getting plastered and doing drugs and harm to your mind and all, because I don't do any of that. No, our, 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 our sins of defiling the temple in the church are a little more refined than that, a little more socially acceptable, like eating too much and exercising too little. Do you know that that's a sin against the body? Amen. That that defiles the temple that God gave us as a resource and an instrument to bring honor and glory to him? We can defile the body by not giving it enough attention, or giving it too much. Here's how we do that. We get so wrapped up in and so concerned with how we look, how we appear, the clothes that we wear. We're going to overspend on it because we, we've got this appearance that we want to be able to maintain. And this posturing that happens because we want to determine um, what other people think of us. And it's, and, it's, and it's just superficial. And we can... Even Christ-following people who come to church on Sunday morning can stand in their closet for 20 minutes trying to figure out what to wear because we're so concerned about that. Who cares? As long as you cover it up, come on. But we can get to the point where we are so concerned about the superficial that we begin to neglect the very spirit of the God who says, I want to call your body my home. That's one of the ways that this temple image is used in the New Testament. But it's not the only way. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, um, he gives us another image or idea of this whole temple idea. Help me out back there, Ephesians chapter 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. He's writing to the church. This is a rem- kind of don't forget who you are thing. You are, you're not foreigners and strangers. You're members of God's household. Okay, keep going. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become, here it is again, a holy temple in the Lord. Amen. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The temple analogy is not just the brick and mortar of the temple in Jerusalem. It's not just the body of Jesus or the body that is you. It also encompasses the church, the gift of each other, where he says this, the way it's supposed to work is we're being structured and knit together brick upon brick, layer upon layer, tied in um, above and below and, and connected to each other so that we form this edifice, this beautiful thing that is a dwelling that is fit for the very Holy Spirit of a holy God Amen. to be right at home. Yes. And all throughout the letters of the New Testament, it's Paul writing to churches who got, they need a little bit of help in getting that thing figured out. You know, we deal with people who uh, sometimes say, I don't want to go to church, it's full of problems. You ever hear anybody say that? Let me, give you, let me give you a little clue here. If the church was not full of problems, we would not even have a New Testament. Because, you know, you, if you stop after the Gospels and, you know, if, if, if we didn't have the church and the church be full of messes and problems, it would just end with the Gospel of John and then maybe Revelation. But pretty much everything in between all those letters that were written to churches, why did he write them? They were messed up. And they needed needed some help in figuring out how do we live as a temple of God together where his Holy Spirit gets put on display for the whole world to see. And we read things like, well, you got to be united. You can't be fussing with each other. Division, it destroys the temple. If you pull out, start pulling out bricks, it'll make a mess of things. We, and we know that one of the things that, uh, that the enemy likes to do is to try to create that kind of chaos because it keeps us from keeping our hand to the plow and being engaged in the mission that God has given us. Um, have you ever found yourself concentrating on something that really didn't matter? And it saps your mind and your energy and your thought processes when, when you could be doing something productive like seeing somebody get saved. Amen. When we get scatterbrained in our focus, God, the Spirit, wants to keep calling us back to, and reminding us who we are and what we're here for. Do you know that we live in a city that needs Jesus? Amen. And if we don't get our mind fixed on that, we're going to be wasting a whole lot of time whenever we could be being very productive for the cause of the kingdom. Yes. Be united in your relationships with each other, in your common mission. He, he, he talks about the temple in a lot of different ways. 
There is this temple, bricks and mortar. We need to take care of it. That's right. And whatever happens here ought to be the stuff that God makes him happy. You're the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. It's where he wants his spirit to be so living that it's all him and it's not us. That it's his thoughts, not our thoughts. That it's his ways, not our ways. That it's his passions, not our passions. He wants us to be so completely consumed with him that we could be described as the place where God lives. There's a scripture in Zechariah. And I would have never, it never would have come to my mind if Pastor Patrick hadn't brought, oh, he's in the nursery. If he hadn't brought it to my attention. We're sitting in staff meeting a few weeks ago. We're talking about this scripture. And he goes, hey, there's a scripture in Zechariah that applies here. I'm like, how did you know that? You just happened to be reading Zechariah yesterday and boom, there it was. No, it was in one of those notes at the bottom of the Bible, on the page of the Bible says, you know, this story connects with that one and that one helps make sense of this one. And these two things can kind of go together if you put them there. That's what happened. So this is the scripture. And uh, the translation that I'm reading this one out of is the message because it's a little better translation. On that day, the big day, the day of the Lord. And this is the prophet looking out sometime in the future. All the horse's harness bells will be inscribed holy to God. Now that doesn't mean anything to us. We don't have a hitching post out there with all y'all's horses that you rode to get here. But it does mean something to them. I'm going to break that down in just a second. The cooking pots in the temple of God will all be as sacred as chalices and plates on the altar. In fact, in that day, the day of the Lord, all the pots and pans in all the kitchens of Jerusalem and Judea will be holy to God of the angel armies. People who come to worship preparing meals and sacrifices will use them on that big day. There will be no buying or selling in the temple of God of the angel armies. Can you, can you imagine that scene in John chapter 2 when Jesus is turning over tables and he's, he's sending those animals uh, flying and he's giving the money changers a new PCS? It's not going to be the same anymore. It will not be business as usual after Jesus shows up. The prophet said, there's coming a day when all that mess is going to be over with. And you know what he connects it to? I, I'm, I'm envisioning a great big eraser. An eraser that takes the line between sacred and secular and goes. There will be a day when what's in your house is just as holy as what's in God's house. There will be a day when your kitchen is the place where God dwells just as powerfully and as real as he dwells here. When God is at home in your bedroom just as much as he is at home in his temple. Where God is at home in your workplace and in your car. We don't have horses, we have cars. But you know that God wants to make that a holy place where he's very comfortable being as well? Here's the deal. We've got, a, we've got a Savior who is absolutely consumed with zeal for what happens in the temple. Whether that temple is here, or here, or here, or at the place that you call home. He wants it to be a place where he is alive and well. So can I just ask you to kind of think about something this morning? If Jesus were to walk into this temple, this temple, that temple, would he feel the need to pick up a whip and start wreaking havoc? Are there things going on in your spirit, your heart, your mind, your life, your relationships with each other, your home, that aren't very hospitable to him? One of the things that makes the Jesus that's in this temple today, our house of worship, different than the one who walked in the, 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 the mess in John chapter 2 is that if he sees something that he doesn't like, he's not going to do that. He's not going to grab a hold of cords or, or chains or leather or whatever. He's not going to whip up a whip and just go in and barge in and start cleaning house. Not in our house. He'll do that in his house. But he won't do it in ours. 
unless we let him. Amen. He's got a different way of doing it now than he did then. The same Christ who grabbed hold of a whip before the story's over submits himself to one. And the night before he gets hung up on a cross, he gets beaten repeatedly with a whip that marks his back up and the blood begins to flow. And in less than 24 hours, he stretches out his hands and his feet that are nailed to a cross and the blood begins to flow. And as he hangs there, a spear is taken and jabbed into his side and the blood begins to flow. And here's what the writer of Hebrews has to say about that. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy. How? Not with a whip. But through his blood. 